Sure. And I'm excited to talk about some, a, a topic that I love very much as we continue to explore the saints and how they can serve as guides during these tumultuous times that we're living through. Um, I'm going to look a little bit at at the Orthodox Church, so the sort of spiritual practices of the East, which Liza Anderson last week gave us a great introduction to, thinking about the Jesus Prayer, which is a, a spiritual practice that's really central to that, to the especially to like the historical church, but especially the Eastern Orthodox Church. It really is the heart of spirituality in that tradition. Alongside, you know, if you can think of that as a more auditory form of prayer, of connection with God, today we're looking at the visual side of that, which is the practice of icons and praying with icons, um, which, as Liza mentioned, are a sort of way into another way into a state of being with and communicating with God. And so we're going to look at a lot of images together. Um, I'm going to kind of talk through some of them. I'm going to share the PowerPoint after this. So if you if there's anyone that you want to spend more time with, you'll have that opportunity. I'm also going to pause at a few points and invite your questions, but also, and I think more importantly, your noticings. Um, I definitely, as we look through some of these icons, we'll be inviting you to kind of share your reflections on what you see in them and, and how they're drawing you in or what is challenging about them and just how you're finding yourself engaging with them. And I realize this on virtual format isn't ideal in a lot of ways and that, you know, it, it will flatten the icons and it's different looking at them on a screen. Um, but I, it does also open up for us the chance for us to look at a breadth of, of different icons and different and portrayals of scenes from the lives of the saints and the life of Christ that we might not otherwise be able to um, if we were in person and relying just on what we had in hand. But before we get to all of that, I'm going to start us off in prayer. And this is a prayer that I found a lot of different versions of that, that one might say before writing an icon. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Enlighten and direct our souls, our hearts, and our spirits. Guide the hands of your unworthy servant so that we may worthily and perfectly portray your icon, that of your holy mother and of all the saints, for the glory and adornment of your holy church. Forgive us our sins and the sins of those who will venerate these icons and who, standing devoutly before them, give homage to those they represent. Protect them from all evil and instruct them with good counsel. This we ask through the prayers of the most holy Theotokos, the holy apostle Luke, and all the saints, now and ever unto ages of ages. Amen. I'm going to share my screen now. And I'm going to start us off with an icon that will likely be familiar to many of you. I think if, if any of you have, it, and as I know you do, if any of you do have experience with icons, this is probably one of them. <clears throat> this is the Trinity or the hospitality of Abraham. Um, it's an old form of icon that originally was meant to really explicitly portray that scene from the life of Abraham and Sarah, where the two of them are visited by three angels um, who come to deliver news that they will have a child. And Abraham and Sarah host them, they offer them food and drink, they make them guests in front of their house. And so you have this version um, painted by Andrei Rublov, who is probably the most famous Russian icon writer. Um, who lived in the late 14th into the mid 15th century. This is his version, which is the most famous. And it did a number, there are a number of differences between this and earlier versions. Um, the first being the way that the figures are seated. You see them kind of spaced out around the table. The older forms of the icon had them sitting next to each other. So sort of like they were at like a banquet table at the front of the room and all looking at us. And so this version offers 
kind of a different take on that, where you have the figures seated in almost this, in a sort of triangular pattern. But as you look, you can see it almost, it creates a circle around their halos, down around their feet. Um, and the circle being that great symbol of unity. And you don't have Abraham and Sarah present in this icon the way that you traditionally would in this form or style of icon. But it really is focused on these three figures who represent the Trinity. And I invite you just to take a minute, just look at, look at this icon, see what you notice. What draw, where is your eye drawn? What do you pay attention to? What is, what is the experience of looking at it? I'm just gonna give us probably about 20 seconds and then just invite your initial reactions. And just invite a few folks to share. What do you see? What are what are you drawn to? Hi, Nathan. I'll go. Great. Thanks, Kari. Um, I'm drawn to the light. The light that similar around the heads and also on the table, similar. Mm. So it's just very inviting to the table. I just, I don't know, there's a connection there or something. Yeah, that's great. Mary, you are muted. The sheer beauty of it, the posture, the kindness of their faces, the, the comfort that they project, the sweetness, I guess I would say. I'm drawn by this structure in the upper left-hand corner. I'm intrigued by what it might be, a, a house, um, a worship space, uh, It draws me in. I was drawn to the upper right hand corner, that circular motion. And then mm -hmm. I noticed the figures in the margins. Uh, and while it's, it's really the whole circular effect that drew me most, I began to I've begun to wonder about some of what these, what the the faint illustrations that seem to me to be pretty in, intentional suggest. Hmm. It's hard to tell what is what is age kind of deteriorating it and what there might have been. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw a human face. I thought there for a moment, hmm. or a caricature there, uh, yeah. right up there. Could be, and a lot of icons will do that where they have this sort of central scene in the foreground and then around the edges kind of on what we would think as the frame of the picture depicting small scenes. So, you know, and you might have the single picture of a saint in the middle, but then live sort of pictures of different scenes that the people would have known different miracles or healing stories or just pictures to evoke the different stories from the life of a saint. So as we, as we move eventually to thinking about what, what it is to pray with icons, I think key to that, and one of the things that your comments bring up is that, that they're fundamental, they're so multi-layered that you know, even though these, these pictures, these images, these icons are, are on one hand seem very simple compared to I think more contemporary art forms in that the perspective is flattened. So you don't have the sort of depth of field that 
probably us as contemporary viewers are more used to seeing in, in artwork. And yet every line that's drawn, every structure that's put in, the, the gestures, the clothing, all of it is, is richly layered with this, with this rich symbolism to it, that everything within it has meaning and it, it comes out of a tradition. And that's one of the things that makes an icon an icon, that it wasn't something that, that a monk at a monastery would just all of a sudden have an idea and decide to paint it. That you know, occasionally forms of revelation would come to them and new icons were being created. But so often they first, they were always in reference to other forms that the tradition comes out of the belief that even the face of Jesus was, was imprinted onto the shroud that covered him in the grave. And that that was the first kind of pictorial representation. And since then, icon writers have been trying to faithfully represent the true faith, the face of Jesus, as well as the true face of the apostles and other figures that are being represented. Nathan, mm -hmm. do you use the word icon writers as opposed to painters for a reason? Yes, so that is that's a good question. And it um in the Orthodox tradition, especially in the in the Russian and I think the Greek tradition as well, that icons, the word you use is to talk about them being written because they're understood to be almost a form of scripture, that they aren't, you know, painting is I think seen as just depicting an image in a sort of like snapshot kind of way, whereas to be written implies a sort of revelation and, and, apply, and implies that there's a reader, that there's a more dynamic engagement between icon and viewer. And so that an icon is written and meant to be read like a piece of scripture that through the icon is meant to be communicated who God is and how God is at work in the world. And you know, if we think about these as being part of the product of a largely pre-literary society. Um, I mean, these a lot of the icons that we'll look at are coming from the 10th to 15th century in, in Byzantium, as well as into Russia, where literacy was very low. And so, you know, a whole breadth of both like the con what's contained in scripture, but also later theological understandings are contained within the icons. Thank you. And so looking at this icon of the Trinity, we'll see a lot of the sort of themes that are central to iconography. There's, you know, it almost the way that perspective works, whereas we are used to seeing paintings kind of receding back into the distance to that vanishing point kind of way back into the artwork. The perspective here is reversed. So if you look, it kind of flares out from us where the image opens up rather than closes in. And you can almost imagine like looking at the lines from the chairs and from the way that the angels are seated, that it's almost coming in, coming towards us, where we are the point where those lines converge. And in that way, the icon works as an invitation, that it's inviting us into the scene, that we are seated at that fourth side of the table. And this is a representation of the Trinity is meant to show the relationship between the three persons of God that are distinct, but part of one whole. And so again, thinking about that circle, there's a motion to each of the gestures on the faces of the angels, looking towards one another around the table, that it's you know, that the Trinity at its core, this kind of central but incredibly difficult doctrine of, of Christianity is, fundamentally about a relationship. It's about the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and that's something so elusive. And, and even though icon writers are willing to paint and to write the image of Jesus and to represent the Holy Spirit, there was a trepidation about depict, trying to depict God, the Father, um, you know, wanting to maintain the mystery. And so often the icon writers turn to different stories in order to reveal, in order to reveal what that relationship is and how we might come to understand God. So here you have three figures that appear in the story of Abraham and Sarah. And yet Andre Rublov in painting that found something fundamentally true about the nature of God within this. That, you know, God is 
this God that is fundamentally about relationship, relationship within the different parts of the Trinity, but also relationship with us. And Kari, I appreciated you noticing the halos around the head and that's then this sort of color resonating with that of the table. And the table is meant to represent the Eucharistic table. We see this chalice here that is sort of signifying the act of communion, that other way in which we are invited to come into contact with God, into relationship with the divine. And so there are so many layers here. And I think part of the, pra the practice of praying with icons is about noticing. It's about sitting with these images and letting your eyes and your attention go where they will. I know for me, often I'm drawn into the eyes, the eyes of the figures that are represented. But some days, sometimes it's the color. Like today, I found myself really drawn to the blue of the central figure, that lapis lazuli, that just rich, deep blue, which each color, and I, you know, I am not an expert at this, and I can't tell you what every single color represents, but you can find guides that will go into what the significance of red, an interior garment of red with blue on the outside represents versus the green and blue, um, and how each of it and each line is imbued with meaning. And just as we as viewers are able to kind of pr to pray with these icons, so icon writers talk about every brush stroke being a prayer a gift offered to God in hopes that others may come close, draw closer, draw nearer to God through, through these works. And so I think one of the fundamental tasks of the icon writer is always not just to paint external events or to write external events, to describe things the way that they were, but through the icon to try to portray an inner reality, something that is that is both historical and spiritual and personal. And so that we may feel as the viewers feel like we are being drawn in and like we are a part of the story. It, and that I think is fundamentally what this practice is about, is about using the icon as a, as a vehicle, as a vessel to draw nearer to God, to be reminded of those stories that are at the heart of our faith, to be reminded of how the, God, the love of God is at work in our lives and to draw closer to God through them. A lot of writers talk about icons as a window, as something that we pass through rather than look at. And I think that, and that is often a two-way street. I think the, the practice of praying with icons is often about looking through the images, using the saints or the angels or the biblical scenes as a vehicle through which we may draw closer to God. But often we, again, thinking about how those lines converge on us. Um, it's often the experience of praying with icons is about us being looked at ourselves. It's, a, it's an act of introspection, of seeing ourselves for who we truly are, reflected in the scenes of holy people or of Christ's life or the Virgin Mary, and finding ourselves revealed through that, you know, both who we are and how grace has, has worked in us and through us, and also where we've fallen short, that I think the icon is meant to do all of those things to help us both, both see God and know how God is present to us, but see ourselves through God's eyes as we truly are. Nathan? Yes. What about yes, the feet? I was drawn to the feet. Okay, what about them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are really interesting. And, you know, again, it's not, no, none of the icon writers, I think were never pretending to portray people as they actually are. That, you know, I think that these, they know, they knew, you know, in the 12th and the 15th century that the figures they were drawing don't look like people look in the world. Um, that they, you know, they weren't purely figurative representations, but, you know, not quite caricatures, but sort of, people portrayed in a way that is meant to reveal part of the soul. And so I don't know what the feet say about the soul in this image, um, but they certainly are interesting. And I imagine we're part of that. So this is just an icon of Andre Rublev, who himself was, was made a saint. Um, and there's a wonderful film um, called, yeah, it's called Rublev, 
R-U-B-L-E-V, um, or maybe Andrei Rublev, but it's by Andrei Tarkovsky, this great Russian filmmaker. And it sort of, and it tells the story of Andrei Rublev's life and, and his own struggles with his identity and understanding of himself as an artist, but also is seeking to be a person of faith and live out his monastic vocation. Um, and it just is a really wonderful exploration of, of the identity of the icon writer and what, what that life is. So I commend that to you all. The history of icon writing as, as it's told in the Orthodox Church begins with St. Luke. Um, so sort of legend has it that St. Luke the evangelist who we know from the gospel of Luke was also an icon writer, um, which uh, Diane goes back to your question about thinking of, of icons as writing. And so that was yet another way that St. Luke was to understood to have conveyed the word of God through visual images as well as the written word. And so you see the angel there with him kind of guiding him in how to portray Mary and, and Jesus. So as I've mentioned before, that what is happening in the icon is really about moving from making abstract theological concepts, this idea of, of God become human, the idea of the Trinity, these sort of these concepts that are hard to grasp and hard to, I think, hard to hold on to and, and to make them concrete, to portray them in concrete form. And, as, and to constantly remind us that fundamentally our faith is not about what is happening in some other world, but it is that bridge between the divine and infinite reality of God and our own finite and historical lived experience. And so often in iconography, the figure of Jesus is very central, um, just as, as the as the vehicle for our salvation, as the person through whom God became flesh. Um, and so this is this icon, a Christ pentocrator, or Christ who's ruling above the heavens is central. Um, you'll see it in Orthodox churches above the altar, um, also portrayed in the very top of the churches, often at the very top of the dome that is at the kind of apex of a center, kind of a cruciform Orthodox church, you'll see this image of Christ seated above. And the icon is meant to be a window onto mystery that, you know, I think one of the features of the Orthodox church is this heightened sense of the mystery of God. That, you know, the, in, in that, in the Orthodox world, they didn't go through the same, I think the enlightenment, it didn't have the same effect there that it did in the West. So, you know, and we can think of, look back to the 16th and 17th century and what was happening in, in especially Protestant churches, but Catholic churches as well, of this move towards rationality, of trying to ground faith more and more in reason to prove what the life of Jesus actually looked like and, and to, to back ground a faith more in historical fact, historical truth, um, and to see that as, as necessary. Whereas in the Eastern church with, I mean, these churches tend to be incredibly elaborate, just icons everywhere, candles burning, incense burning, this ethereal chanted music that it, it understands faith primarily as being about coming into contact with, with divine mystery, with the unknowability of God that we can get glimpses of, but can never fully and totally understand. And so I think this icon is one example of that. We have what's called a mandorla, which is the sort of this figure that surrounds Jesus that you see coming time and again, that has the four points to it. And it's kind of here overlaid with another four on the outside. And, and that figure is often represented behind Christ, just indicating that he's both perfectly human, but perfectly divine, both knowable in a human way, and, and yet the sight of the revelation of the mystery of God. 
And this is, this is an iconostasis. So this would be at the front of almost any Orthodox church. Um, you can see that in it, it follows a set form. So there are multiple tiers to the iconostasis where surrounding the altar, you always, we have Christ at the center, that same image we saw before of Christ sitting enthroned. We have Mary and the infant Jesus above him, as well as then the various apostles, disciples, angels. It kind of goes out in the, in the centrality of the figures from there, as well as the as scenes from the life of Jesus. Um, so behind these doors that are referred to as the royal doors is where the altar would be. Um, and so those doors would be open through most of the service as the priests perform the ritual and liturgical action. Um, they get closed at certain points during the preparation of the table for communion. Once again, this is all about heightening the mystery. Um, it's, you know, I think it, for us who, especially in the Episcopal church where, you know, we've done a lot, we've even moved our altar off of the, again, from against the wall, um, you know, so that the priest can face the, the people that we focused on on the desire for transparency in what's happening in a lot of ways. And I think that's really important and came out of a really good place. This orthodox understanding though is very different that, you know, it's not meant to exclude people, but there's an understanding that that element, that maintaining that element of mystery to what is happening and to how God is present in bread and wine, as well as shining through these painted icons is, is really important and that that is a fundamental and kind of the central at one of the central aspects of our faith. As I mentioned, kind of one, this is Saint, Saint Paraskeva, who was an early Christian martyr um, and one of the common female figures depicted on icons. Um, one of the features really central and I, I always find really striking about icons is the eyes. And, you know, I often find myself drawn to the eyes that are much are larger relative to the size of the face and to the, the figure depicted themselves. And, you know, again, they, those serve as that window and a reminder that that people don't pray to the icons, that you go into an Orthodox church and you'll see people kissing icons and kneeling before them, lighting candles before them. And it's never about the icon itself, that there's not a belief that, that the icon itself is the source of holiness, but that it's fundamentally a vehicle, a vessel for God's love to shine through towards, shine out towards us. And often the eyes are understood to be that window that place through which we can see through the icon and look towards God and through which God is looking through the saint or the figure depicted and towards us. This is just another example. This is actually one of the oldest icons that we'll look at um, from the sixth century at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And here you have something really interesting where Christ has almost the two different facial expressions. So if you look the line, the middle line of his face, the eyes look different from one another. And it's not, you don't know exactly what that's about, but it's thought that that was just intended to represent the two natures of Christ, human and divine. There's the Trinity icon again. And so now I want to talk a little more specifically about some of the practices in, the, in, in Russia and the Russian church. So this is where I first came across the practice of praying with icons um, and really first found it as a way to express my, express my own faith and find you know, it's, I think it's hard for me to say exactly what captured me about the practice, but you know, I think there is something so emotional about kind of coming into contact through, with God through some of these icons, through these painted images created by humans, but meant to kind of convey the spirit of God. And, and I found myself so drawn in by them. So this is a 19th century Russian painting. And what we see here is what 
our typical Russian house at the time. Um, you know, that would be, this would be a peasant's dwelling, but in the corner of it is what they call the Krasny Ugol, the red corner or the beautiful corner. Um, in Russian, in older forms of Russian, Krasny both means both red and beautiful. Um, and so there would be a corner of someone's home that would be devoted to housing their icons, um, to having lanterns lit before them, that it would be the site of prayer. Um, and, and the icons were a way for folks to, to take what, was, what happened in church and bring it into their home. That there is a sort of meant to be a sort of seamlessness between the liturgy of what happens on daily in the Orthodox tradition in, in churches and monasteries and to bring that into the homes of every individual. And again, that goes back to what Liza was speaking about last week with the, this invitation to pray without ceasing. And the idea being that having these icons displayed in one's home offered both a space and an opportunity and a reminder of that need to give thanks to God for all the gifts that we have but also an invitation to transform our daily lives and work into an offering to God. The next thing that I, are there any questions? I've kind of rushed through a lot, but I'm just wondering, is there anything else that has jumped out to folks that you're, that you're wondering, that you noticed? I have a quick question. Yes. Um, how old is the the first one of the Trinity? How old was that? That one. Yeah, fifteenth century. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So you know, and a lot of these have been restored and and carefully preserved. Um, I think the medieval monasteries were such incredible repositories of of knowledge, of books, of art, um, and so it's it, it's truly amazing that we still have so many of these old icons in, in the shape that they are. Nathan, on the icon we've just been looking at, mm -hmm. the beautiful corner, I don't, I'm, I might be extrapolating a little too much, but I'm thinking this is a sick bed, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that its position in relation to the corner is no accident. Yeah. I think you're right that that would have been, you know, this idea that if God is coming through those icons, then closer proximity to them is closer proximity to God. And, you know, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm making an overgeneralization, but I think we, maybe a part of like the Protestant Reformation was this distrust of putting too much stock in God's presence in material things. You know, it, it was the, think of the like the traditional Puritan New England church with, with its stark white walls and no ornamentation. Um, and that is a, that's something that's been present in Christianity for a long time that there was a, a huge debate in the ninth century. Um, there was a movement of an iconoclastic movement that really, literally sought to sought to ban icons. That it was part of a theological movement that put all of the emphasis onto the divine nature of Christ and the sort of spiritualized understanding of faith, and and really in a way that denied the importance of phys our physical existences. Um, and the counter argument that eventually won out was that Christ is fully human and fully divine, that, that the material world is important and is valuable and that, there, that there's a continuity between, this, between spirit, the spiritual and the material. And, and I think you see that embodied in these icons where they are material things. And you know anyone who prays to them knew is that but there are also material things through which the spiritual becomes real. Um, and part of that is the prayerful way in which they are created and generated, their, their place in, in a long tradition of, of how these figures on them are portrayed, um, but also just the, the belief in the stock that people have put in them, the way that folks have been praying to these same icons for hundreds of years 
think imbues a certain significance to them, at least for many people who pray with them. So I want to spend a little bit of time thinking especially about icons of Mary. Um, so in the tradition of icons, there, there are probably, there are, I, you know, this is a completely non-scientific survey, but I'd say there are almost as many icons of Mary as there are of, of anyone else combined. That, that figures of Mary, especially Mary with Christ, are really central to the tradition of iconography. And there are a few distinct types of icons of Mary that, that come up time and again with slight variations. And, you know, a lot of them harken back to sort of older forms and draw from different <clears throat> traditions. Like this one referred to as Our Lady of the Sign. And the sign is the, the revelation of of Jesus to the world as and Jesus as Jesus comes through to us through Mary. Um, and so you can see Mary's arms are lifted up in what's called the Orans position, which is the traditional posture of priests celebrating the, the holy liturgy, um, celebrating communion. And yet here Mary is in that same posture. And this same posture is also part of older Greco-Roman um, liturgical practices. So pagan rituals, often the priest would be standing in, in this way. And yet here Mary is, this, the, this woman who is central to the faith. Um, and I think the Orthodox have a really high theology of who Mary is and a deep understanding that without Mary, salvation wouldn't have happened. That it is only because of her saying yes to God's invitation that we have been granted salvation. And that that could happen through sort of a human consenting to the, to the divine call is a, for them central to their faith. I mean, it, I think again, as, as Protestants were taught, you know, every, the, the, everything's about grace, not works, that it's only through the grace of God that anything happens. And yet in the Orthodox world, I think there is this melding of, of grace and works that is really important. And, and I think Mary is the, the central point of that of a human being being able to say yes to God and that being able to transform the world. And that's, I think, what, kind of what this scene is meant to communicate is how Mary's yes, how her opening up to this possibility of new life coming through her is, is where we all owe our gratitude for, for the life that we have been given in God and in Christ. Again, this is a 12th century icon. It's just I'm truly remarkable that this is 800 years old, 900 years old. So this is another type of, of icon of Mary. Um, and I choose this one. This one is has probably aged less well than some of the ones that we've looked at. Um, but this one comes from Vladimir, which is a city in Russia. And there's a lot that's, I think, significant about this type of icon, that this is, fits into a larger category of icons of Mary referred to as, as loving kindness icons. And again, as, as icons are meant to represent in, in physical kind of tangible form, abstract theological concepts, to me this, and, and many commenters that have written on how this form of Mary an icon is all about the love of Mary for Jesus, but that is a stand-in for God's love for all of us. That I think that we talk, you know, maybe it's as a clergy, we tend to talk a lot about the love of God and what it does in our lives. And I think it can be difficult to make that real, to kind of ground in concrete terms what that love of God is and what, what it means and what it's doing in our lives. And so I think looking at this icon, it is meant to be a physical representation of that. It's meant to evoke the feeling of what, at least a hint of what God's love feels like kind of in a very experiential way beyond just 
the idea of God's love. And so you see, and you'll see it in different, slightly different forms, but Mary cradling Jesus, their faces touching each other. Um, yeah, and what is, there's an incredible amount of, of intimacy there. And it's a reminder that that Jesus was fully human and had embodied the full emotional landscape of, of all of us. Just as at a last week in our reading from the gospel, as well as in Liza's talk, we thought about, you know, the place that anger has in a life of faith. Here, I think the icon writers are conveying the tenderness that is present in the love of, of Mary for Jesus, the love of Jesus for Mary, but also the love of God for all of us and of holding us. Another kind of interesting thing about this icon, this is, this is one of the, especially in the Russian tradition there, and but all over the Orthodox world, there are a number of miracle working icons, icons that have either been present to or that folks have prayed to that have led to either miraculous healings or victories in war or any number of miraculous occurrences. And the legend around this icon, um, some of these more, I guess, the, some of the, the more famous icons of, of the Orthodox world have moments that were referred to as apparitions, moments when the icons appear. And so we don't know who painted or who wrote this icon. The story that, that has been passed down is that in the 15th century, a monk connected to this monastery in Vladimir had a vision of Mary and she led him out into the woods, into a piece of, of a little a clearing. And he dug into the ground and unearthed this icon. And it just appeared to him at this moment when he and his community needed it and became this uh, a mir miracle working icon associated with any number of healings. And, and that story in various forms repeats itself a lot in, in the Orthodox world of, of an icon appearing that rather than being explicitly created by someone and then preserved. Um, so I invite you to make of that what you will. Um, for me, it really, just heightens the centrality of mystery and that expression of faith, the unknowability of God and, and our invitation to take part in that, to be a part of the story of God continuing to reveal God's self in and through the world. And this is another early um, icon from that loving kindness style, the, the tenderness. Um, so you even here see Christ's arm draped around Mary's neck and in that the closeness of that embrace. Actually, I'll, I'm gonna go back to that and invite, are there any, any thoughts, questions, noticings, anything that caught your attention in especially those icons of Mary that we've looked at? The proportion, mm. the relative pr proportion has got to be there to, to convey a message in itself, of, um, to make it, dare I say, to make a point, that's too, that sounds too sharp, but it's certainly to convey uh, a great deal. I've, yeah, and especially the figure of Christ is almost always depicted less in the proportions that you would experience a child and more just like, like a tiny man. <laughs> like it's the best, only way I can describe it is- um, Sometimes a tiny old man. And in this case, a tiny man with very long arms. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And I, I, I hesitate to say exactly what that is. I think it had to do with sort of must worry about infantilizing Jesus in a way that, you know, I, I think there is a sort of locked image of, of who Jesus was. And so in childhood, he's even portrayed as he was understood to be as an adult, but just smaller. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's a, 
a real an interesting thing and a, and a fascinating feature and I think it'd be off-putting for some folks because it feels so other um, but it really that it's fundamentally done out of a devotion and this uh, coming from this a spiritual sense of who Jesus was. One other thing about this, these loving kindness icons, um, that they're, I think they're meant also to be an example of what, or what Christian love looks like, of how we are all being invited to embody God's love. And I found this, this is a quote from Isaac the Syrian, who was a, a medieval Orthodox saint and, and teacher who himself engaged with and pray, was known for his practice of praying with the icons. But in one of his sermons, he asks this, what is a merciful heart, a heart on fire for the whole of creation, humanity, the birds, for the animals, for the demons, and for the, all that exist. And in the, ortho, so in the Orthodox worldview, this love of Mary that's shown in this icon is most directly for Jesus, but it's also for all of us and for all of creation. That in, in Orthodox spirituality, Mary is seen as, as this almost perfect embodiment of how we are all being invited to love the world and to love God present in all things, all, the, all of God's creatures, both inanimate and inanimate. I like that he even includes demons in that. I think there in the Orthodox tradition, there's a strong sense that nothing is irredeemable, that nothing, even the demons are, are capable of, of receiving God's love, of being transformed by this love of God and ultimately brought back into union. So the way that you know one often prays with icons, I think similar to the Jesus prayer is is meant to you know through this through the scene that's being portrayed and depicted to ourselves come to a place of peace that it's fundamentally about finding harmony with the figures in the past of our tradition, the figures who are still present in our tradition to come to feel in harmony with. Christ, with God, with Mary, and with all, the whole communion of saints um, to find kinship and communion. And often the, and one of the reasons that Orthodox churches tend to be so elaborate is they see themselves very much as a place of refuge, of, you know, themselves almost a timeless space where, you know, once one crosses through that threshold into this ornate building that they're able to leave everything behind, to leave the cares and concerns and the rest of the world behind, or to bring them into that space and allow them to be transformed. But it's about finding sanctuary, um, about occupying and stepping into the space that sits between our everyday earthly lives and, and the sort of divine spiritual realm. Um, they're liminal spaces, they're thin places where, where God is present and the work of human hands are, are done in order to heighten that sense of presence, to be a vehicle through which that God present in the sanctuary can be communicated to those who are coming to pray. You know, whether they are seeking consolation or, or just performing what they feel like is their weekly duty, that it's meant to provide us a, a place of safety, escape, refuge, where all of a sudden, you know, by coming into contact with, with God, the spiritual world, that all of a sudden the cares of, of daily life become much more manageable. So I'm next gonna turn to the little bit of time that we have left, um, one figure in particular from the Orthodox Church. This is my personal favorite saint um, in the Orthodox tradition, Saint Sergius of Radonezh. So Saint Sergius lived in the 14th century. Um, 
yes, the 14th century, just before Andre Rublev. Um, so actually, it is in some traditions hold that that the icon of the Trinity that Rublev painted was passed down as as a vision that Saint Sergius had of the tr Trinity. That that the image that Rublev would would put on on canvas or put in in paint was described to him not by Sergius himself, but by Sergius's successor. So Saint Sergius is known as the reformer of, of Russian monasticism. He's seen as almost a Saint Francis figure um, that there are all these all kinds of wonderful stories. And, and in a lot of the lives of Russian saints, these appear of his harmonious relationship with animals. And I don't know if it, that appears in any of these scenes that are depicted, but at one point as he was building the Trinity monastery that became really the, the beating heart of, of Russian orthodoxy um, as he was building the first wooden structure there that a bear, he befriended this bear and would give half of his tiny ration of bread to share with the bear who became his friend and companion in his isolation. I think, you know, much, much further into history than, than we, are used to in the West. Um, the Russian church and, and Orthodox spirituality was really, was much more open to the experience of wanderers and hermits and people who lived really, you know, unorthodox lives. And Sergius definitely fit that bill that he, from his early, the conversion, his conversion to Christianity um, into his life, it spent a lot of time in solitude and in the wilderness. He, really his spirituality was forged in the Russian countryside. And you can imagine these deep, dark fir for and birch forests of the Russian taiga. Um, and was a solitary figure for a lot of his life. But there's this balance between his solitude and the way that he became such a central figure in the communal expression of faith in this monastery. And so a lot of Russian saints, you find this, this need for balance between peer, long extended periods of solitude and, and life together. That the wisdom that's gained through that, that solitude, through the experience of temptations, of isolation, becomes a gift that is later and then offered to the community. And you know, it's often those figures who spent the most time in solitude who are revered the most for their wisdom. And Sergius was certainly one of them. And this is, so this is a traditional iconographic portrayal of his life. But I also want us to look a little bit at about how more modern, how the tradition of icons has been rendered into sort of more modern contexts. And just invite you to consider, you know, the different ways that you are, are drawn into or connecting to these, these other works. So these are paintings from the life of Saint Sergius by Mikhail Nesterov, who was a 19, late 19th century, early 20th century Russian painter, um, who explored a lot of the themes that appear in icons and, and drew his in influence from the Russian iconographic tradition, but also from the Russian countryside around him. So here you see one of the earliest moments of, of Saint Sergius's life, who the st as story, the story has it, as a, as a young person, six, seven years old, he was still really struggling to learn how to read. And I think at this point, wasn't even really speaking. Um, and then in his, one of his wanderings through the forest, one day he came across one of these solitary figures, a wandering hermit who carried with him a bit of reserved communion in this box. And the hermit offered to share, share the communion with St. Sergius. And this was reportedly the first time Sergius received communion. And afterwards, his, his mouth was open, his tongue was loosed. He was able to speak and was a, learned incredibly quickly from there. And that it was this first point of contact with God, of God working through his life. These are from the same artist. You can see just this, he had a real, Nesterov had a fascination with the figure of Sergius. There's Sergius with his bear in front of the first, the, the church that he built that would become the site 
of the of the Trinity Monastery outside of Moscow. You can see it powerfully evokes this the Russian landscape alongside this iconographic tradition. And I love even the herbs draped into his belt. There's a sense of harmony with the natural world. This is a, just another iconographic representation of that same scene with Sergius and his animals. And this, this is a triptych that's in the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow that just portrays different scenes from the life of St. Sergius. Again, the building of the monastery, evoking the, you can see his shoes are made of woven bast, which is the inner bark of linden trees that was, that was the footwear of choice for much of medieval Russia. Um, and just these various scenes, him as, him as an older man, of thinking back on, on his life, maybe in this more reflective posture. And so I think this is before oh, I'm gonna wrap up in just a minute, but we just love what are your what are your reactions to seeing these works that aren't quite icons but maintain some of that? But uh what is your experience of looking at these? I still think the radiance that comes through. Yeah. There's a sweetness about these. I I would not have thought to call them icons. Yeah, and I don't, I do wanna be careful about that. And I think I'm not explicitly calling them icons either. I think they are taking, drawing from that tradition and situating it in a new way. And for me, looking at these, there's something incredibly prayerful about them, or I find myself drawn into a similar posture of prayer, though it is a different experience for sure. It's not unlike what you see in other 19th century European painting, mm -hmm. though, in terms of the level of, of sentiment or emotional. Yeah. Suggestions. I think all of these kind of evoke pausing mm. and just contemplating and just being, which is nice. I think we all need to do that a little bit more. It's mm. an excellent point. And I think that is a the heart of the tradition of praying with icons. It's about pausing, it's stopping to, to get lost into, into a work of art, to kind of be swallowed up by it and, and brought into, into God's divine embrace. Um, there's a one I just wanted to share a quote from Saint Seraphim of Serov, who is an 18th century or 19th century Russian saint. And he talked, he said this, Acquire a peaceful spirit and around you thousands will be saved. Especially in this time where there is like the world we live inhabit is tumultuous, but so was the world of St. Sergius, that this was the time where Tatar hordes were ravaging Russia, were basically on the threshold of taking Moscow, that he was alive during an invasion, a Polish invasion incursion into Russia, that he was seeing a lot of change in the world around him. And Seraphim of Serov, who said that quote, was what, witnessing the sort of struggles of the church around him and increasing secularization. And yet, you know, these monks, these hermits, these folks who fled to the wilderness were able to understand and to find that sense of peace. And I think their, their lives and the icons that, that attest to their lives invite us to do the same to pause, to contemplate, to get lost in an image and, and to find God through that, to come into contact and, and to just be. That it's a form of prayer that isn't about saying the right words or knowing the right words or you know, about feeling like we have to know exactly what it is that we want or need, but simply abiding with God, being present to God and allowing God to be present with us. This is another portrayal of, of, 
um, Sergius from a different 19th century Russian artist, Nikolai Rarek. I just think it's a, a fascinating different take and the vibrancy of colors always draws me in. So that, and it, I invite you, you know, I think that this practice of praying with icons is a valuable one as we look ahead to Holy Week towards those, the scenes of those incredibly vivid scenes at the end of Jesus' life from the entry into Jerusalem to Good Friday to Holy Saturday to the Saturday to the resurrection at Easter. We didn't have time to get to all of those scenes today, but I'm going to, after this, I'm going to send out the PowerPoint, but I'm also going to track down some of those, specifically those icons of Holy Week, um, those scenes that pair with each of the days and invite you just to sit with those over the course of Holy Week, um, just as part, perhaps, if that's something that interests you as part of your practice during those, those holy days, um, just to let the scene unfold before you and within you and to, to find yourself in it, to be drawn into those scenes and to experience God through them. Any last questions before noticings, wonderings before we break? Go ahead, Elaine. I fully appreciate icons much more now than I did but I also appreciate your knowledge and your comments uh, are, are like a, a sermon that goes along with it, a homily, whatever. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Elaine. All right. So Compline is at 6.30 and next week at 5 p.m. on Sunday, the one, the only Steve Falsey is going to present on Saint Ignatian, Saint Ignatius, the Jesuits, and praying with the examine. So I commend that to all of you to join us at the same time next week. <laughs>